Auburn legend, Olympic legend, Rowdy Gaines uh, is with us. Um, if, if you don't know who this man is, I, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, <laughs> um, he, he has more medals and honors uh, than uh, I've probably seen in a, a uh, bookcase of anyone, <laughs> you know, uh, in a That's high school crazy. or anything. But um, Rowdy, you know, when this, the coronavirus pandemic first came, came started spreading here in the United States of America. Right. I was talking to some of my colleagues here covering Auburn and we immediately started talking about your situation and in the situation for hundreds of American athletes when they were preparing for the 1980 Olympics and you right. were in your, you know, in your prime at that point, you know, back, back in those days, swimmers, you know, um, you could obviously tell me more than, uh, than I know, but, when you were in college, you were, that was your peak form, your peak opportunity, and you were at that spot, and I believe you were in a position to compete for, what, five gold medals five of, in right. five events in That's the 80 right. Olympics, and of course, the United States goes, hey, we're not, we're not participating. Take me back to that and what your feeling was when you, through all that, and you finally heard, hey, it's not happening. We're not going, and the soonest right. you'll be able to compete on that level is – 84, which is a long time in a yeah. athlete's life. Sure is, Brandon. I, yeah, I mean, 1980 was an extremely hard year for so many of us. Uh, and, and I came out, to tell you the truth, um, very blessed because I had 1984 um, and I had another opportunity. There were 336 athletes on that team in 1980 that didn't make it in 1976 and didn't make it in 1984. So that was their lone Olympic Games. And so I can definitely empathize. I can sympathize with um, the athletes and where they're at now, the ones training for the Olympics, the ones that were uh, in their senior years. <clears throat> I can just tell you that I went through a series of emotions when it all went down. First of all, it was complete denial. Like there's no way they're going to cancel the Olympics or there there's no way we would boycott the Olympics the Olympics still happen um, but there's no way our country would not send a team so that denial uh, is the first feeling which I'm sure early on in this process a lot of the college athletes felt like the same thing I mean I could I was talking to them you talk to them all the time like oh no way that's not gonna happen and then you think well we could still play basketball but just not in front in front of fans so it just it progressed from denial and then into anger um, I was very angry. I was very angry at our government. Uh, I was angry at our president uh, that we would do such such a thing, which is a little bit different than the athletes might feel because this is an invisible enemy. Not that the president was an enemy, but the decision was a bad decision. And then, um, and then it's an extreme depression, you know, because as you said, I, I think the pinnacle for a swimmer. Uh, at that level is the Olympic Games. We, we don't have a World Series or Super Bowl. It's the Olympics. So to have that taken away was, um, was you know, hugely disappointing and depressing because we had to wait four more years. And, uh, and finally, there's acceptance. You finally accept it um, and you try to move on with your life. And that's, that's primarily what I did. I had a great coach in Richard Quick. I had great teammates. And um, I had great friends. I had great family. And I think for, for me, that was what I relied on tremendously. When that, when that all happened, did you just, did you drop swimming for a little bit? Did you get away from I it? I did. I did after, well, this happened in 1980. That was going into my senior, senior years. Year. Yeah. yeah. So I was really very much focused on my task and my task was I was elected captain in my senior year and focused on that team so my coach did a great job in in kind of refocusing my energy to my senior year in college and that's what I did but after that after 1981 I did retire um, I, I quit the sport retired from the sport back then not so much quit but retired yeah. uh, and that lasted about six months um, and decided, uh, long story, but I decided to, to come back and, and give it a shot. And after the summer of 1981, so I went through my senior year, which was in March of my senior year. And then I went through all summer lifeguarding and, you know, mm -hmm. playing 
uh, but then decided to go forward. So when you, you get back into it, um, you know, and after your college career, are you thinking, I think I can be ready for the 84 Olympics? And when did that start getting on your radar? Well, it has to right away because, uh, uh, again, I was done with my eligibility. So I didn't have anything to really have that long-term goal to shoot for except the Olympics. Now, there were a lot of short-term goals be between 1981, the summer of 81, and the summer, <clears throat> excuse me, the summer of 84. In the fact that, you know, we had the world championships, world championships we had Pan American yeah. games, we had different big meet nationals, et cetera. But, uh, but I think that's what hurt me a lot, man. I, 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 I think along the way I was really hurt by the fact that I didn't have a lot of those short-term goals to shoot for like you do in college. Uh, and uh, for me, it was a little touch and go there for those three years for sure because back then we didn't have any money. So once I was out of college, you know, I was living on my own, working as a night clerk in a hotel, mm. eating a lot of macaroni and cheese, you know. Um, so it was, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't all, uh, you know, these, these uh, bells and whistles that go with uh, being an Olympic athlete, for sure. You know, swimming, there, it's a team sport in some ways, but when you're out of college and you're on your own a little bit, and I'm sure you've got a coach of some sort, yeah, I know, but is there a factor in there of some like loneliness and oh. do you doubt yourself? And I mean, how do you Absolutely. deal with that? Definitely Brandon. It was, yeah, it was, it, I mean, listen, it's, it's swimming. It's, it's, it's not the real world. I understand, but for, for an athlete that when you, when you're an, you're a, 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 an Olympic hopeful, you, 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 you get this vision, right? And you mm -hmm. kind of block the rest of the world out while you have that tunnel vision. So there really, really were four things in my life that only mattered during this entire eight year journey. And that was swimming, school, eating, and sleeping. <laughs> Those are the only really four things that I, that I had to concentrate on. And not, um, not ladies, not the ladies. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have enough. I was too tired at night. <laughs> I was way too tired. <laughs> Uh, but, but the point is, is, is when that gets swept away in a moment, because it's not supposed to be an eight year journey, it's supposed to be a four year journey. You, you definitely ha start to have doubts. A and especially for me, because in 1980, as you said, that was my best year. I, I mean, no question about it. I was world swimmer of the year in 1980 and my times that year would have won five gold medals. You never know when you get into a real life situation, but my times that year. But you, 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 no doubt in your mind, you would have won five. I, I feel, I feel confident about that. And okay. I do. I mean, it's been, you, you it's been 40 know. years. You, you could say, yeah, you yeah, could yeah. say it now. I, I, I do. I, I mean, there was no question I was at the top of my game in 19. Yeah. But you flash forward four more years, Brandon, and I was definitely not the best swimmer. When I, I, in fact, I didn't make the 200 freestyle, an event that I had the world record in in 1980, which would have, which took me off the 800 free relay. So that's two gold medals right there that just left in 1984. And then I barely made the team in 84 in the 100. And when I got up on the blocks in those finals against those seven other swimmers, I, I really should have probably been fourth or fifth. I was definitely not the best swimmer. There were four or five guys in that race that should have beaten me. But I felt like I, I deserved to be there. You know, I felt like I put harder, I put more work in than anybody else. And I felt like I deserved it. Not in a cocky kind of way, but I felt like I, I really belonged in this moment. And I was going to seize the moment, seize that one swim because the other nine, they beat me. So I needed to seize one of them. I mean, did, I mean, you obviously, did you just see that as this is my only opportunity? Yes, this is the last absolutely. chance. Absolutely. No question about it. You know, th this was it. Um, and, and, and again, I felt like I had done the work. No other swimmer in that final had been a member of the boycott team in 1980. So, you know, there's that little bit of self-assuredness of saying, you know, you guys didn't suffer like I did. <laughs> I'm the one that suffered. You didn't. You'll have your moment, maybe your day in the sun in 88. Mm -hmm. But this is, this is the moment I'm going to try to seize. You know, I wasn't, I never knew for sure, but I was, I was definitely prepared mentally, emotionally, 
and physically. And a lot of that credit goes to my coach, Richard Quick. After that all happens, you win three gold medals. I mean, at that point, you're, I'm sure you're thinking my, my career is over. But, I, you know, we know that you tried to, to get back into it and everything. What was it like after the 84 Olympics and trying to figure out what the next step was? It, it, it's really difficult because, again, you have that, that tunnel vision for so long that you, you start to doubt yourself whether you can accomplish things outside of the water. You're so good at that one thing, you know, and you have so much confidence in that. But the great thing about swimming is, and I'll stack our sport against any other in the world for the values it teaches you, as any other athlete in any other sport would do the same thing. But, you know, the words like dedication and commitment and responsibility and teamwork and setting goals, those are all words that I learned along the way in swimming. And I think, for the most part, I, I tried to apply them when I did finish swimming. It took some time. Definitely took time, dude. I for the like first year after the games, whew, you know, it was it was first three months was great, <laughs> but after that things started settling down, and uh, it you know it and not not to feel sorry for myself, but it was just it was it was a little bit of a a bummer of a time. So when it comes to the Tokyo Olympics being postponed here for a year, how much does that affect? not just the U.S. team, but, you know, teams across the world when obviously you dealt with something that was a four-year period. They're looking at something that's maybe at least a one-year period as, as it stands mm -hmm. now. But, man, a lot can change in someone's yeah. body, their Crazy. approach, yep. other people that are coming up in one no year. Doubt. How different are things going to look just even with the U.S. swimming team and, if not that, just other sports going into the Tokyo Olympics and – 2021 yeah yeah it, it it could dramatically change the makeup of the team no, no doubt about it because uh an athlete's life can come and go at that age injuries age i mean I'll, I'll give you an example um a lot of people know the name ryan lochte and ryan one of the greatest swimmers in history uh he's 37 years old you know which is which is pretty ancient in swimming um, and he's just kind of hanging on this year. He, he's like the third or fourth best swimmer. They take the top two in each event. He's right there in the United States. Another year, though, and he's going to have all these young guys that are behind him start to come up now. And how much faster can he get? He can do it, no doubt about it. You, you don't want to doubt a guy that's won 11 or 12 Olympic medals, but he's an example. And another example could be a young person a young girl or boy who is really good at 13 or 14 and all of a sudden things start to change physically for them and that changes the makeup of their body and changes the makeup of the application of what they're trying to do this summer so it's it's crazy how it, it definitely can change there's a big difference between the word boycott and postpone you know so these athletes i think can one year is much more manageable than four years. And, and, and again, I'm just talking about those aspiring go to the Olympics. What you said at the very beginning, but those seniors in college, it's, it's just, I feel, feel so bad for them. And I hope that people like you that are a lot smarter than I am can come up with some sort of plan to, to give them that extra year of eligibility. I don't know how it's possible. It may not be possible, but it just seems to me that there are people a lot smarter than you and I that could probably figure out a way to, to make that happen. You know, I, that's, that's what's so uh, unique about this situation is you have a lot of seniors and yeah. particularly everybody wants to talk about uh, men's and women's basketball who were about right. to get into the postseason and it just suddenly ends for them out of nowhere in a lot of ways. Um, I know for Auburn, their basketball team, they were practicing in Nashville and then about 30 minutes later, they were told you're going home. Um, there was uh, a lot, there's a lot of hope at that time for in those hours, Hey, maybe the NCAA tournament will happen. And then that was quickly squashed. And 
you know, the NCAA is going to discuss giving an extra year of eligibility to. Do you think it will happen? The spring sports, I see it. I just don't mm-hmm. see it with winter sports. And basketball is a winter sport. Right. right. And the reason for it is because the argument that could be had is a lot of teams did have their seasons finish already, whether in the right. smaller conferences and, and their conference right, right, tournaments. Right. Right, so right. do you give an extra year of eligibility to people whose careers were already technically yeah. over? Yeah. Um, I just don't see it happening, um, which is but sad. Do you think the spring sports will be like baseball and things like I th- that? I think the big question there, Audi, is do you give everybody an extra year of eligibility, meaning a freshman is still a freshman instead of being a sophomore, uh, or do you just give it to seniors? Is, is that fair? Yeah. And how do you deal with the scholarship equality, Title IX? Yeah. It's, uh, it's a very complex issue, but it's something that the it NCAA is. is going to discuss and uh, potentially reach a decision on here actually pretty quickly from my understanding. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, I don't know how they're, they're going to be able to, um, yeah. considering I mean, there's just so many factors and, and budgets for, for schools and everything, especially the smaller yeah. schools. Yeah, especially um, now. Yeah. Um, I mean – the big discussion now, of course, is will the football season happen or will it be delayed or shortened? And football, yeah. as we all know, is it's the money maker, it's the cash cow, it's what keeps a lot of programs afloat that are not mm-hmm. in the power five. Mm-hmm. If you don't have football season, you could see you could start seeing some colleges going, we gotta drop sports mm-hmm. um on the smaller level. But mm-hmm. anyway, that's all hypothetical stuff. That's a lot of looking forward. But if you were let's let's say Auburn invited you to to come chat to the seniors that whose careers ended, and you can relate to that just from the standpoint of you had the 1980 Olympics ripped away from you, though you got a second chance in '84, but still, I'm sure it gnaws at you still that you missed out on that opportunity. Absolutely. In 1980. Um, what would you tell the kids if you could talk to them today that had their, had their careers ripped away and, and a chance to go compete for a national title and they'll never get that chance again? Well, there's nothing that I could say at right now that could make them feel better. I mean, I'm not going to be egotistical enough to, to, to have them even think that whatever I could say would help. But I would point out that for me personally, I learned a lot more from my losses than I did from my wins. You know, Um, I think my kids tease tease me about saying peaks and valleys all the time in life. But it's true because those valleys I experienced, I think, defined my character much more than my wins. They hurt more, obviously. I think they made me who I am today. And I think those val- that, that valley that they're feeling right now, and it's not going to go away anytime soon, but it's going to pass. It, and, it, and they're going to be better people from it. They're going to learn the lessons they need to learn from it. And eventually, they're going to turn out okay. It's going to be okay. Because really, it, it's all about the journey more so than the end product. Uh, I mean, they, don't get me wrong, winning the gold medal was awesome, but along the way, I learned most, most, so much more from the journey. So those seniors, for the most part, not all of them, for the most part, they had a journey, you know, and maybe it was a three and a half year journey, but at yeah. least they had that journey, you know, and, and so that's something that a lot of people will be able to not say, you know, that they didn't have a journey that they could count on. You know, I, I sit back and I think about players like Auburn basketball players like uh, Samir Dowdy, who right, a senior this year. Yeah. And I'm for him in the back of his mind, I'm sure this whole season was seen as a redemption tour or a revenge tour, whatever you call it, from the Final Four last year. Because remember, he got ca- called for fouling that three-point shooter against Virginia. And that's what oh, won that's the game. Right. Virginia. That's right. Whether the call was right or wrong, it happened. And all I remember after that game is Samir Dowdy sitting in a locker room for 30 minutes and answering every question wow. straight and forward and being humble. And you know his right. mind was just completely right. gone. Crushed, yeah. 
I, I can never imagine seeing a college athlete uh, respond as as maturely as he did. He was so mature. No, oh, that's and great. Humble, and so I, I'm I, I'm sad for all the athletes whose careers may have come to an end. I am uh, too. But for guys like Samir Dowdy, who saw this as an opportunity for to kind of get something back for himself, to piece himself back together, I can't imagine what he's going through. I just yeah. can't. I can't either. And, you know, that's the, that's the tragedy behind all this because there are probably a lot of um, dowdy stories out there and he's just one of many and, uh, and you got to feel for him, but hopefully he'll, you know, be able to take this and learn from it and, and have a successful career, whether it's on the court or off the court. So what are you and the family doing during this, during this time trying to self isolate and everything? Well, here's my wife right here, <laughs> sitting with me. That's Brandon. Hey, I'm good. How are you? Hi. She said, "Say hi." Hanging out with my grandfather up there. And oh, picture wow. of him. <laughs> wow. We're just yeah. We just moved. Uh, we had a lot of stuff in our storage, and mm -hmm. uh, so it got delivered this past week. So we're just kind of unpacking. Yeah, she's taking. She said she's taking advantage of having me home, and I'm doing. A, I've got a lot of honeydew uh, lists. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of what we've been doing. We've been yeah. cleaning everything and yep, yep, yep. moving things, re uh, yep. reorganizing yep. things that only need to be reorganized. Yep. I know, um, I know. We did the same thing. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm sure there's just some disappointment, but I'm sure you're looking forward to getting to cover the Olympics. You know, yeah, yeah. It was it was going to be fantastic. It would been it would have been my eighth games, and uh, but you know what? I'll I'll call my eighth Olympics next summer, and yeah. uh, it will be it will be I think it will be the most exciting, special games that we've ever had. I really I really believe that. I think it's going to be the the most electric, fantastic Olympic games in history. Because that you know that's the thing is it's um everybody talks, you know, Auburn or, or the national level, like, man, when college football comes back, it's going to be a celebration. But I'll yeah, tell you what, it will. The Olympics, when the world gathers, it's a celebration anyway, but that moment is going to be so amazing. Yeah. We all come back and rise above it. It's going to be amazing. Yep. It will. It will. No doubt. I can't wait to see it. I'm sure you can't wait to see it and be there covering it. Um, yeah. Rowdy, Looking thank you so much for joining no us problem, and sharing your probably. story um no no problem I'm a big fan hang in there keep keep writing about our tigers man i will we're being as All creative right. as possible trying to find good. everything we can write about so good good thank you sir living All legend right. appreciate Take you so care. much